Welcome to Upper Valley Access, your monthly video magazine. This was a pretty big month. It was so busy. Yeah, so what happened? So earlier this month was the 2016 Law Enforcement Torch Run. Uh, the Hartford Police Department, Fire Department, and volunteers got together for this fundraiser for Special Olympics Vermont. This month, the production team had the opportunity to go into the Marion Cross Science class with Lindsay Putnam. She leads um, a LEAP program, which stands for I'm going to read this. Learning about environmental education through experiential practice. Look for interviews with her about this experiential learning program and hear some really insightful conversations with the students themselves. Emily, I hear there was a block party in White River Junction. Yeah, so Hartford Community Coalition put on a block party. There were tons of nonprofits, businesses, people from the community, and just like last year, we asked a special question. And so stay tuned to see what that was. I am Nevaeh Barton and I am from, You're from Lebanon, New Hampshire too. Lebanon, Lebanon, New Hampshire. My name is Dana Mikulovic and I work at the Good Neighbor Health Clinic. I'm from Lebanon, New Hampshire. I'm Noah Detzer. I am from uh, White River Junction. My name is Allison Litton and I live in Wilder. Graham Robinson, White River Junction, Vermont. White River Junction. And I'm from White River Junction. Hartford in 50 years. Hartford, do I have to keep my eyes closed? No. Okay. Hartford in 50 years, I think White River Junction will be a robust, vibrant community, not only of the arts, but have strong businesses. Well, in 50 years, I really hope it doesn't change much, because it hasn't changed much in 200, I don't think. Able to retain the quaintness that it has today, yet still offer more of a seamless system of support to individuals in a welcoming, accepting of all environment. To be able to bike from Queechy down to Lebanon. So I'm really hoping that they, um, they get bike paths so that people can bike safely. Royal Castle Dragons Imaginary. More family oriented, uh, less of the drug epidemic that's going on. Um, and just a happy life for the children. I think it's going to have bubbles for tits. Hopefully it'll be the same, but I'm sure it's going to turn into like the city, just like everywhere else um, at some point. That's just how the world is, I would say. I see a diverse and inclusive community, and since I work at the Good Neighbor Health Clinic, I see a community where everybody has access to health care and dental care. I imagine a fully inclusive art community here in the Upper Valley. Um, services for the uh, community to have like help with special needs and um, teachers that will be trained in like autism research and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean ideally we're going to get to a place where this is going to be a destination, you know, people are going to want to come here, just maybe for the art scene, um, just the way that kind of the, the culture of the, of the town is going to be inviting and, um, and unique in a way. And you can already see kind of seeds of that with the cartoon studies place, Northern Stage, all that kind of stuff. And I feel like it's, the seeds are there, it's just a question of when they're going to kind of be harvested. Junctions just right up. Right up the mountain and down. So, my name is Lindsay Putnam, and I run a program called LEAP at the Marion Cross School, and that stands for Learning About Experiential Education. Whoops, I screwed it up. <laughs> Learning about environmental education through experiential practice.
projects. This program was created initially by two women who were teachers here and they hired someone to do a different kind of program than we have now. Um, this person created curriculum and trained other teachers in how to do environmental activities that were more game-based. And the idea behind the program was that teachers throughout the school were doing environmental education, but they were doing it very unsystematically. They were, some teachers were more familiar with the subject area than others, and so some classes were getting more exposure than others were. Some teachers went on a lot of field trips or hikes and other classes didn't. So the idea was that it would standardize an environmental education program. Um, and so when I took it over in its second year, I started by asking people, what do you want? What, what do you need from me? And they were less interested in environmental games. They were less interested in being trained to run things on their own. And they wanted a school naturalist. They wanted somebody who could help them teach the kids science. And so we went from a, a program more like you would see at a camp, a summer camp, to, um, to field-based science. And um, it has evolved over time. It's gotten more in-depth. Um, it's great that we are able to do it through all six grades because we can start in kindergarten with an awareness of environmental education and environmental science and how to be a scientist in the field. And by the time kids are in sixth grade, they're really doing very impressive stuff. And so it builds on itself that way very nicely. We were doing a water quality analysis that we've done for probably 15 years and we report the results to the Conservation Commission, the Norwich Conservation Commission. Uh, I think we we're just going to find a bunch of animals, uh, well no not animals, uh, well, animals, organisms, uh, well, yeah, organisms yeah organisms and uh, uh, stoneflies. Mayflies. Mayflies, yeah and then uh, maybe, if, and then maybe if we're lucky find a crayfish. And then, uh, fly larva, crane fly larva. Well, but the thing is, it depends how maybe. good the water value is. So the way they determine it is by collecting samples of benthic macroinvertebrates, which are the little bugs that live on the bottom. And every one of those has a particular pollution tolerance. And so they identify the bugs. They give it a score based on its pollution tolerance and they do a calculation that gives a total score for the brook. And what we've been finding out every year is that it is extremely good water. It's not impacted by, you know, you can use the word pollution, but other things impact water too. And so this is good quality water in Blood Brook. We think a lot about safety on field trips and um, managing the crowd and so we had not so many kids but there was enough room for everybody to have their space and not be all on top of each other and that that um, shoreline was safe shallow no high water they've been doing this since they were kindergartners so they know how to behave in the field they have a task a very specific task oh hey look Find something. You can off. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, what in the world is that? It looks like a stonefly. Stonefly larva? Yeah, I think that's a stonefly larva. It's a real task. This gets reported to the town, and um, there's a precedent that 
we've been doing this and this is uh, an important piece of data and it's their job and they kind of rise to that. I would say that's true um, pretty quickly after kindergarten. Um, third grade, second grade there's still a lot of exploration going on and the same for third but they're expected to collect data in the field in a way that is, you know, controlled and accurate and, um, and they get better at it every year. We're usually under rocks, kind of hiding in the river, so we're like kind of rubbing them to get any bugs off and catch them in the net. Oh, look how huge that is! Oh my god! I would say that as much as possible, everything we do is experience-based to some degree. And so this program is a natural fit for this school. But uh, it, it is also specifically designed to get the kids outside doing field research. It definitely makes more of an impact, I believe, to have your hands doing something, doing the real thing yourself than reading about it, especially for students, for kids. Uh, I think that would be the same for everybody, but the experience is more visceral. It's your every emotion is engaged, every sense. Uh, it's something that your brain really can wrap itself around. It's not just reading, which is really a very sterile kind of a way to do experience science. This, uh, this way of doing science is um, completely 100% sensual and experiential. Oh, there's something. There's something. Where is it? I think it has a lot to do with the teachers. They're very creative and um, they understand that kids learn by doing. He's a great teacher. His approach is to be um, structured in such a way that they know what to expect and um, what to do and the fact that they're not willy-nilly all over the place is a result of that. Some schools around here have had a program like this in the past and uh, I believe that some may still, but uh, it takes funding and uh, about 12 or so, 10 years ago, Antioch was funding trial programs like this along the Upper Valley. Some of those schools were able to hang on to that and when Antioch uh, stopped funding it and some of them haven't been able to. If I was trying to really pitch it, I would invite somebody to come like you guys did because you really get the full sense of it if you participate and look at their work and look at their enthusiasm. I just like going in the river and exploring and figuring out what things are. It's just kind of fun to find really big um, bugs because they're just, they're very fascinating and like, they're kind of like, wow. I was touching the huge thing.
but you want to know what the environment is like down there. So you don't want to just look for the good guys or just look for the aquatic worms that can tolerate anything. You want to get the best idea you can of the whole environment. And so to do that, is it good to have a few or is it good to have a lot? A good lot. Have a lot. A lot. Definitely. Gives you a better picture. It's like when you go to vote, you know, for something in town, if only two people show up at the voting booth instead of 200, then you don't really know what the whole town feels like. So the more population we can have, the higher population in our counts, in our data, then the better, the more close we are to, you know, a really accurate number or accurate picture. Okay, good. Well done. Let's go. They're great kids, and it's great that they gain experience, you know, through all six classes, so great, so that they can do some real science. So, 
play the music, and all I ask is that you sing and kazoo along, and this is how we're going to end our morning together. Hit it beat. It was a great day. I'm happy that everybody came and supported us. <laughs> Every year it has been very small, maybe 10 officers um, and fire department people. Uh, this year was the biggest one we've had. Easily we had 100 people registered. And it was what we've always wanted it to be. We're here today to honor our Olympic athletes from the town of Hartford and the Upper Valley. We're represented and will be represented this coming weekend by the Upper Valley Hawks. Let's hear it for the Hey, I've got a proclamation from the town to honor all of our Special Olympians. Uh, so I'm going to start with Whereas Special Olympics is a global organization that unleashes the human spirit through the transformative transformative power and joy of sport every day and the world, and whereas through programming in sports, health, education, and community building, Special Olympics changes the lives of people with intellectual disabilities and raises awareness about their talents and abilities, and whereas the Upper Valley has had a Special Olympics team for many years, referred to most recently as the Upper Valley Hawks. I think more than over 300 people, that's the most that we ever had. I hope it's even bigger than next year, than this year.
Well, let's start with science fiction, because I think what I'm talking about today is pretty close to science fiction. And go back to a movie, I think this came out in 2001, it was based on a Philip K. Dick uh, science fiction novel. Uh, and uh, Philip K. Dick was the inspiration. Many of his stories were used for blockbuster Hollywood movies, like um, uh, uh, The Minority Report and uh, Blade Runner, um, Total Recall, some of my favorite movies. Um, now, in the Minority Report, if I'm, there are these people called precogs. So they're lying in this bath of warm water, and they have these sensors on their head that you can just barely see that are reading out their brain activity. And these people are, have, have visions of um, crimes that will be committed. And so the idea in this uh, future that Philip K. Dick described is these brain sensors measure their patterns of brain activity. And what do they do with them? They read them out so they can see the visions that the precogs are having. And who reads them out? It's Tom Cruise. <laughs> so here's Tom Cruise, and he's putting their images up on the screen. And then at this point, ah, he sees a crime about to be committed in the future and they send out the police to stop the crime before it happens. So this eliminates crime in the future. So it's a wonderful story. It's science fiction. But so the idea is you can read brain activity and from that activity understand what the person's thoughts are. This is science fiction or is it? In this study, what the people did is they had the subject listen to words. And then they measured their brain activity using this other technique, ECOG. And from the patterns of activity that they measured in um, language cortex in the left hemisphere, they built a model so that they could then produce a sound, a sound file, that uh, was their best prediction of what that pattern of brain activity corresponded to in the subject's real experience. And let me play this for you. What you're going to hear is the word that they heard, Waldo, okay? And then followed by the reconstructed sound, reconstructed based on brain activity, using two different models, a linear and a nonlinear reconstruction. And then it goes through the other words, structure, town, doubt, uh, property, and pencil. Now don't expect this to be um, Tom Cruise. But just remember, we're at the early stages here. Oops. Waldo? 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 Structure? Structure? Town? Waldo? Waldo? Doubt? Doubt? Waldo? Property? Property? So it sounds kind of like someone is trying to say these words from underwater in the bathtub. But still, it's recognizable. It's recognizably uh, distinct. So what could this be good for? Well, imagine someone who has uh, a disease like um, Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, who's unable to speak because of paralysis. And we know from uh, uh, communication devices that these patients have intact intelligence and can communicate if somehow they can get the signal out. Well, it's conceivable that their brain activity could be directly decoded to drive a speech synthesis device, allowing people with Lou Gehrig's disease to speak. Now, that doesn't exist yet. But th I think this is a demonstration that that kind of thing actually is feasible. Emotion it's another type of information, just like you say. You know, the person could be sad or happy or puzzled or dismissive. I mean, there's all, many shades of emotion in people's responses. And that's another area for neural decoding research. So one of the people, one of our junior faculty, uh, who is very computational, he is uh, tackling that, how to decode emotion from brain patterns.
As always, thank you for watching Upper Valley Access. If you have any ideas or stories that you hope that we pay more attention to, please let us know. We are located in... At 85 North Main Street, White River Junction, and Tip Top Media North Building. Come visit us.